بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد Respects the listeners We <coughs> gather once again for the continuing study and commentary of the hadith of Hudaybiyah from Sahih al-Bukhari we began three weeks ago and so far we have reached the part of the hadith where the narrators say that the Prophet وسلم, prodded, goaded the camel qaswa and she leapt up. As a very quick summary, the Prophet وسلم, left Medina at the beginning of the month of Dhul Qa'dah in the sixth year of Hijrah with the intention of performing Umrah. This was the first time he was leaving Medina, <coughs> heading for Mecca after the Hijrah. Many events took place on the journey. I've explained all of them in detail, so I'll repeat them here. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ arrived to the west of Mecca, having taken a detour, and eventually passing by a very rugged and rocky, unconventional route, the Prophet ﷺ arrived in a region known as Hudaybiyah. And just before Hudaybiyah, his camel sat down, Aswa, the camel. And then I explained the events of that part of the journey as well. Eventually, the Prophet وسلم, the Sahaba عنهم, said that Aswa, the camel, had become difficult. Prophet وسلم, said, no, he hasn't become difficult or obstinate. The reason it sat down and it's refusing to get up is that Allah, the one who restricted the elephants from entering into the city of Mecca, that Allah is the same one who has restricted Aswa from proceeding any further except by his command. After this conversation, the Prophet sallallahu what did he do? فَزَجَرَهَا he, he prodded Aswa the camel, and then upon his command, it rose again. In fact, it leapt up, and the Prophet sallallahu continued with his journey. قَالَ فَعَدَلَ عَنْهُمْ Prophet sallallahu the narrator says, فَعَدَلَ عَنْهُمْ Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam moved away from them. Again, he took another slight detour. Hatta nazala bi aqsal hudaybiyati. Until he descended and came down to the furthest part of Hudaybiyah. Hudaybiyah, a spread out region, part of it is closer to Makkah al Mukarramah. And the earlier part, i.e. further away west from Mecca, that region is furthest from Mecca. 
So this is what's meant that the Prophet wasallam settled in the area of Hudaybiyah, which was the western side, therefore the furthest away from the city of Mecca. Where did he come to? Ala Thamadin Qalil al Ma. He settled in the furthest part of Hudaybiyah at a spring, Qalil al Ma of very little water. Now it's not mentioned here in this narration, but we learn from other narrations that the Quraysh learning that the Prophet وسلم, was now very close to Mecca because, as was mentioned last week, Khalid ibn al Walid, who was heading a cavalry unit, a reconnaissance unit, he, as soon as he saw that the Prophet وسلم, had taken a detour and he missed them, and he and his cavalry unit only realized with the dust trails that the Prophet وسلم, was taking another route, he rushed back to Mecca, he informed them. The Quraysh then came out of Mecca armed. And a, group, a large contingent of the Quraysh, they came towards Hudaybiyah because they realized that he was coming from that direction. And since Hudaybiyah was, uh, like I said, a spread out area, there were a number of wells there. In fact, I, we keep on mentioning Hudaybiyah. What was it named after? Of course, it's the name of a place in a, a small area. But what, why was it called Hudaybiyah? It seems, uh, well, some of the Sahaba عنهم, quite clearly mentioned that there was one well there which was called Hudaybiyah. And the well, it's, uh, and it also appears that the well was called Hudaybiyah. Well, there was one well which was called Hudaybiyah. Why was a well called Hudaybiyah? Because it was directly underneath a tree which was bent and hunched. So that tree was known as Hadba, the bent, hunched one. And because the well was directly beneath that, this is a diminutive of Hadba, Hudaybiyah. So that was the name of the well. And it was a one single well. But then the whole region came to be known as Hudaybiyah. And in that whole region, there were many wells. So the Quraysh, when they came out, they occupied the area closer to Mecca. So they occupied the eastern part of the small area of Hudaybiyah, where there were many wells. So because this was a desert in warfare, what they would try to ensure that they were the first to race to the resources, just as happened in Badr. There was a race to try and get to the wells of Badr. So similarly here, the Quraysh, since they were closer to Mecca, and most of the wells were in that area, they managed to occupy the eastern part of Hudaybiyah, closer to Mecca, which meant that they now controlled most of the wells. The Prophet wasallam, since he was coming from the western direction, he was further away, he occupied Aqsa al-Hudaybiyah, the furthest part of Hudaybiyah, i.e. the western part, away from Mecca. And there, there was only one well. And in fact, it wasn't even a well, as the narrators say, عَلَىٰ ثَمَدٍ قَلِيلِ الْمَا The Prophet ﷺ came to and settled at a spring. قَلِيلِ الْمَا of very little water. يَتَبَرَّضُهُ النَّاسُ تَبَرُّضًا so when the Prophet ﷺ arrived, the Sahaba عنهم, had already arrived at the well. And what were the people doing? It was a spring of very little water. The people were scooping up the water very little by little. So there was such less water that the Sahaba عنهم, began scooping up the water with their hands or trying to scoop up the water and bit by bit. Sorry. 
So the people did not leave the well or the spring. It wasn't even a well. The people did not leave a spring, leave this spring, hatta nazahu, until they emptied it. They dried it up. There was no water left. وَالشُّقِيَ إِلَىٰ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْعَقَشِ And complaints were made to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of thirst. Obviously this was a desert and there were no wells, there was not even a single well, rather this was a spring. And the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, those that managed to get some water, they scooped it up bit by bit, otherwise soon it became completely dry. So the Prophet ﷺ was approached by the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum and they complained to him of, their, of the heat and of their thirst. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do? فَانْتَزَعَ سَهْمًا مِّنْ كِنَانَتِهِ Prophet ﷺ drew an arrow from his quiver. ثُمَّ أَمَرَهُمْ أَنْ يَجْعَلُوهُ فِيهِ Then he instructed them to place the arrow in the spring. فَوَاللَّهِ مَا زَالَ يَجِيشُ لَهُمْ بِالرِّيِّ So by Allah, the spring continued to bubble with water. حَتَّى صَدَرُوا عَنْ Until they all returned watered and irrigated and quenched. In another narration of the same hadith, <coughs> there's a bit more explanation. The Prophet وسلم, and they approached him and told him that the water has dried up. He He did two things. Only one of the two things is mentioned here. The other thing which he did was that he asked for some of the water. So the water was given to him. Prophet ﷺ washed himself partially using that water. He gargled and then he spat back in the water. And then he told them, pour this water back into the spring. Then he took the arrow from his quiver and told them to place it therein. Now, it, was, it wasn't a very large well, but it, was, it wasn't a spring without a base. There was a base. So some of the Sahaba عنهم, then descended into this depth with the arrow and plunged it in the middle, and the water started bubbling, rising, and gushing. One of the Sahaba عنهم, actually says that they had to be pulled out with cloth, so clothes were wound up and made into makeshift ropes, and the Sahaba عنهم, clung on to them, and they were pulled out for the fear of drying. That's, that was through the barakah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's arrow from the quiver and his saliva. This was a very common occurrence. There were a number of incidents. In fact, in this journey of Hudaybiyah, there were two miraculous incidents related to water. One was this where the Prophet ﷺ took an arrow and gave it to the Sahaba عنهم, and also spat into the water and the water was poured back in and the water began gushing and bubbling. This was one incident. And then after the whole, after all the events of Hudaybiyah, on the return journey to Medina, another miraculous incident took place related to water, which I will speak about later on, inshallah, when the time comes. But identical stories of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam 
washing himself or doing wudu, or washing his face and hands, or actually doing wudu, and spitting back into the water, and that water being poured into other water and diluted, the other water diluted, and that then increasing and sufficing many different people, like here, 1500 Sahaba radiyallahu anhu. Such incidents, identical incidents, were numerous during the time of the Prophet sallallahu on different journeys. In fact, some time ago we did the hadith of Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu in which we learnt about the Prophet ﷺ marching to the north of Arabia in the ninth year of Hijrah on a journey which eventually came to be known as the Campaign of Tabuk. On that journey, an incident took place related by my Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi in his sahih from the companion Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu an. And he says that at one stage of the journey, the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum that you will come to a well tomorrow. And that well irrigates only a few people, so it's not uh, of copious water. There's not much water there. So when you arrive at the well, my instructions are that nobody is to drink from the water until I arrive. So the next day, when the Prophet ﷺ arrived at the well, he discovered that, well, there were a group of companions already there, but the Prophet ﷺ specifically asked, have any of you taken from the water? So two men said, we have. So the Prophet ﷺ scolded them severely. Then he asked for the water. And again, the Prophet sallallahu and what I'm saying is paraphrasing from a number of different narrations. Again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took the water, did wudu, and gargled and spat back into the water. And then, that well which would normally suffice only a few people, that one single well sufficed the whole army, which was 30,000 Sahaba radiallahu So that's, and then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu and this story is corroborated by other narrators, but in the narration of Muslim, the narrator is Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, O oh, Mu'adh, if you live to see the day, then you will see this whole region around, around the book. He said, you will see this whole region lush and green. And at that time, it was just desert. And again, this was another prophecy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which came true. In another incident related by, again, Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi wa sahih from the companion Abu Qatada radiyallahu anhu. He says that we were on a journey. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was a very long incident, well, there are many details, but on this part of the journey, Abu Qatada radiyallahu anhu says, that the people, the Prophet وسلم, they were at an area where there was very little water. So Abu Qatada عنه, had a mida, which was a small bag with sufficient water for wudu. So there's actually a proper name for this in the hadith. If you have a small container used for water, specifically for wudu, that's known as a mida. So the Prophet وسلم, told Abu Qatada, bring me your mida. 
So Abu Qatada radiallahu an took the midah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he did wudu from it. And remember, Rasulullah alayhi salatu was salam would use very little water. His Sahaba radiallahu anhum relate that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would do wudu in one mud of water. And he would do ghusl in one sa'a to five mud, meaning four to five mud, because one sa'a is four mud. And I've, I've already mentioned to you before that approximately one sa'a, a measure, is 3.5 kilos. And a quarter of that, approximately, is 800 milliliters. So the Prophet wasallam used to do complete wudu in 800 milliliters of water. And sunnah wudu. And he would do the full ghusl in approximately 4 liters of water. One young man said to the Sahabi radiyallahu anhu narrated this, that that much water doesn't, can't suffice me. And he had long hair. So the Sahabi radiyallahu anhu said, well, that much water for ghusl suffice someone who was better than you, mink, and who had even more hair than you. So the Prophet wasallam would do normal sunnah wudu in eight, approximately 800 milliliters of water. And so he, he asked Abu Qatada radiyallahu an, give me your mida. So he gave his mida. He did wudu and he gave it back to him. And then he said to Abu Qatada, look after this mida. For it will prove to it will prove to be marvelous. Then, at a later part of the journey, when the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, because they were in the desert, they ran out of water. They complained to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam about thirst and lack of water. So he asked Abu Qatada radiyallahu anhu again, "Bring me your mida." So he brought him the little bag leather skin of water. So the Prophet wasallam used that water and he began distributing amongst the Sahaba عنهم, and it sufficed all of them. Then Abu Qadadah says that people were drinking and the Prophet wasallam was pouring water into everyone's containers and what had happened is, when they were all thirsty, and they saw that Abu Qatada radiallahu an had some me- had a meal with some water in. Remember, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told him, "Look after this." So he kept it. He made sure that he did not use any of that water. And because of the extreme thirst, when they saw Abu Qatada radiallahu an carrying his bag of water, they were jostling for it. So the Prophet ﷺ said to all of them, remain calm. And there is no need to jostle for this water. Everyone shall be watered. And then the Prophet ﷺ said to them, drink and give others too. I.e. You can, there's enough, there will be enough water for you to drink yourself and for you to give water to your animals. So... Then the Prophet ﷺ began pouring. People drank and gave their animals and their camels water to drink. And then Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu says in the end, there was only myself and the Prophet ﷺ left. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Qatada, using the same mida, that little bag of water, he said to him, here, you drink. So Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu said, no, Ya Rasulullah, you drink. 
So the Prophet وسلم, said, the waterer of the people is always the last to drink. The one who waters is always last to drink. So he gave to Abu Qatada and he drank to his fill. And then finally the Prophet وسلم, drank from the midah. So that was another incident on a journey. And then Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, both of them relate another hadith from Imran ibn Hussein radiyallahu an. He says that, again, they were on a journey. <coughs> People ran out of water. They complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam summoned Ali ibn Abi Talib, his son-in-law, and Imran ibn Hussein radiyallahu an, the narrator of the hadith. And he said to both of them, go, go and search for water. So both of them rode out whilst the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum waited at the camp. So they rode out and eventually they came across a woman riding. And she had two casks or again, leather skins of water, large leather skins of water, hung over her, over the animal, from both sides. So they stopped her, and they said, where did you get this water from? I, which well? So she said, I got this water exactly this time yesterday. So it's a whole day's ride away. So the, and she said that, and that the men folk from our family are away. So Ali ibn Abi Talib and Imran ibn Hussein radiyallahu anhuma both said to her that in that case, come with us. So she said, where? They said, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she said, who? To that heathen that people talk about who's, who's introduced new religion. So, they never said yes, but they said, well, that's who we are referring to. So, the party of three began returning to the camp. Imran ibn Hussein, Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiyallahu anhum, and this lady with, with them. When they arrived, they removed the bags, and they gave them to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet ﷺ did something very specific. He took a container. Then he opened the water bags, both of them, and poured some water into another container. And then he again washed his face, his hands. He gargled and then he spat back into the container. Then he poured that water from the small container back into both water bags. Then he sealed the top. Then he told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum that using both bags, give to the people. So they opened the taps from the bottom, the spout, and they began pouring water. And again, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, drink and give to your animals to drink. And there were so many of them. And all the while, the narrators of the Imran ibn Hussein radiyallahu anhu says that that poor lady was just standing there watching in horror at what was being done to her water. So they poured, they poured, and Allahu Akbar. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhu didn't just drink. They filled their own leather skins and their water bags with the water. They gave to their animals, they gave to each other, and the water did not decrease by a drop in the two bags. Eventually, when everyone had been satisfied, in their thirst was quenched, and their bags and their leather skins were full, the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba عنه, to show her and tell her that, look, we have not reduced your water in the least. We've, we haven't taken any water from you. Rather, Allah is the one who gave us water. 
Then the Prophet وسلم, said to all of them, gather as much as you can for the lady. So they didn't have food, they didn't have water, so how much food would they have? So the most they had was ajwa, dates, specifically mentioned ajwa, dates. So they had ajwa, dates, they had sawiq, which is muesli from barley. So they had these, they had barley flakes, muesli. So they had barley flakes, they had ajwa dates, and a few other dry things. So what they did is they collected all of that in a very large quantity, and they gave it all to this lady. And then they allowed her to proceed with safety. When she returned to her people, she said to them, they were worried about her, but then she related the whole incident, and then she said to them, remember she was a non-Muslim, she said to them, either he is the greatest sorcerer and magician between the heaven and the earth, or he is a true messenger of Allah. Then, not immediately, but sometime later, she embraced Islam herself, and not only embraced Islam herself, but her whole clan, she was the single cause of her entire clan embracing Islam. Her whole tribe actually that lived in that settlement. So that was another incident related by Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu anhu. And all three of these incidents I've related, two of them, that of Abu Qatada radiyallahu an, and of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiyallahu an, both of them have been narrated by my Muslim in his Sahih and by others. And this last story of him was related by Imran ibn Hussein radiyallahu an, and it's actually from both Bukhari and Muslim. So there were many similar incidents. And I've related these three because they were identical to what happened here. The, there are other stories which are in fact similar to the other miraculous incident which happened on the way back from, the, uh, on the way back from Hudaybiyah. So I'll relate that incident and the others when the time comes. But coming back to this part of the hadith, the narrators say, The Prophet ﷺ took an arrow from his quiver, then he instructed them to place the arrow in the wellspring, so by Allah, the, the, the well, the spring, continued to bubble with water until they were quenched thereof. This is for the students of Arabic and for the ulama. What does it mean? Until they were quenched. Undoubtedly, much of the Arabic language is, like any language, is influenced by the climate and the environment. So, since the Arabs would come to water wells, fill their bags and go, for them, water wasn't a constant supply. So this was a regular occurrence. So what are the yiridu wurudan? Means to come to the well. Specifically, it means to come to a well. And sadara yastur, suduran, means to return from the well. So what are the yiridu wurudan? Means to come to the well. Sadara yastur, suduran, means to return from the well. But sadara yastur suduran doesn't just mean raja yirju, rujuan, meaning simply to return. Rather, having come to the well, they wouldn't leave until they had drank the water, quenched their thirst, watered their animals, and they had filled their containers, their leather skins, their water bags. And only when all of this had been done, would they turn back and return from the well? So the returning from the well, sadara yastur suduran, means returning having been quenched. So whenever you come across this phrase, sadara, sadru, an, it means to be quenched. 
This will also explain a phrase which many people have asked me, which they are quite stumped by, they just don't know what it means. And you get all kinds of strange translations. It's said about ulama, or great people, صدروا عن رأيه يصدرون عن رأيه And even the most proficient of translators are stumped by this phrase. صدروا عن رأيه or the present tense يصدرون عن رأيه Simplest way of understanding is as follows. What it means صدروا عن رأيه Some people, you'll, you'll find written translations, they placed him at the front because of صدر, the chest. They placed him at the front. They placed his opinion ahead. صدروا عن رأيه Meaning they returned from his opinion. That's not what it means. It's very simple. Once you've understood the meaning of Sadra Yastur Suduran, all it means is that these people are thirsty for knowledge for an answer. So they go to all kinds of different people seeking a satisfactory answer to their query, to their questions. No one is able to quench their thirst except this particular scholar or this great person. Finally, when they go to him, he satisfactorily answers their questions, gives them what they seek. So when they turn back and return, they turn back and return with his opinion, with his ara'i, having been satisfied and thoroughly quenched of their thirst by his explanation, by his opinion. That's the meaning of the phrase Sadaru an Ra'ye, wherever you come across it. Khairan. So Zala Yajishulahum Birriya Hatta Sadaru Anhu that the water continued to bubble sorry, the wellspring continued to bubble with water until they returned quenched thereof. And in other narrations we find that not only did they return quench thereof, but there was so much water that all the animals came and lay down around it. So it became uh, a pen and a coral for the animals because of the excessive water. Once that had happened, the narrators continue with the hadith, كذلك, So whilst they were in this state, إِذْ جَاءَ بُدَيْلُ بْنُ وَرْقَاءَ الْخُزَاعِيُّ فِي نَفَرٍ مِّنْ قَوْمِهِ مِنْ خُزَاعَ Whilst they were in the state, that whilst they were in the state, Budail ibn Warqa al Khuzai came fi nafarin in a group min qawmihi min Khuzai of his people of the Khuzai. Khuzai was a huge tribe. Budail ibn Warqa radiyallahu an he wasn't a Sahabi at that time. He wasn't a Muslim. And, but he was from the tribe of Khuzar. Khuzar were the natural rivals and the sworn enemies of the Quraysh. And the reason for that is one of the reasons I've mentioned numerous times before. Khuzar actually ruled Mecca until the fifth ancestor of the Prophet وسلم, Qusay ibn Kilab. He led the different clans of the tribe of Quraysh and invaded Mecca, drove out the Khuzar. And they supplanted them as the rulers of Mecca. So now Mecca was occupied by the Quraysh. And the Khuzara were dispersed around Mecca. So they were sworn enemies. And this is why even though many of them weren't Muslim, they were always sympathetic to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa 
and they were around Mecca. They weren't in different. Well, they were. They were mainly around Mecca. This is why. Who was the spy that the Prophet sent from Medina, from Dhul Hulayfa, when he set off? And I mentioned that although he was an Ihram, he was a military leader. He was a diplomat. He was a leader of a state, city state. So the Prophet وسلم, sent Busr ibn Sufyan and he was from Khuza'ah. So he was from the Khuza'ah tribe. So Budayl ibn Warqa al-Khuza'i, he came with a group of his people to the Prophet وسلم, and he wasn't a Muslim at the time. And the hadith continues, وَكَانُوا عَيْبَةَ نُسْحِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم مِنْ أَهْلِ تِهَامَةً And they were, they meaning Khuza'ah, they the Khuza'ah were, عَيْبَةَ نُسْحِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم They were the confidants of the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم For the students of Arabic, عَيْبَةً means chest <coughs> and can mean both bosom as well as the treasure chest one two nus means sincerity and a heartfelt desire for the welfare of the other person originally nus means sincerity ya ayyuhalladhina amanu tubu ila allahi tawbatan nasuha O oh, believers, repent unto Allah a nasuh, a sincere repentance. And this is why the word nasiha means, of course, it means advice. There are many words of the Arabic language which are imported into other languages, like Urdu, the Asian languages. And wherever there's a Muslim culture, the local language, regardless of what it may be, has always imported many of these terms. Unfortunately, the original and other meanings of these words are lost in other languages. And people tend to hold on to the single imported meaning. What then happens is that when they translate Arabic texts, they use the restricted single meaning that was imported into their language and export it back to the Arabic. One example of that is Nasiha. So we hear the hadith, Adinu Nasiha. Deen is Nasiha. Now in our languages, Nasiha means advice, counseling. So you, you often find translations that say Adinu Nasiha, religion is advice. Religion is Counseling. That's not the correct translation. Because the hadith continues. They said, For who, O Messenger of Allah? For whom, O Messenger of Allah? So he said, For Allah, for his messenger, for his book. So what's the meaning of advice and counseling for Allah, his messenger, and his book? It's, that's not the correct translation. The translation is sincerity, simple. It's the original meaning. Adinu nasiha, religion is sincerity. So here, wakan sincerity for Allah, sincerity for His Messenger, sincerity for His Book. So wakan wa'ibat nusih Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A literal translation would be: They, the Khuzaa tribe, the people of Khuzaa, were. A treasure chest of sincerity for the Messenger of Allah. They were confidants of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muslims and non-Muslims. Because they were the rivals of the Quraysh, they were sympathetic to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is why, even though Budayl ibn Warqa radiyallahu an, at that time wasn't a Muslim, he embraced Islam just before the conquest of Mecca, uh, approximately two years later. Still, they were very sympathetic to the Prophet 
So وَكَانُوا عَيْبَةَ نُصْحِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ They were confidants of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم من أهل التهامة from the people of Tihama. Who was Tihama? Not the people, meaning the region. Tihama is a region. The Arabian Peninsula was divided into a number of sections, and it's always been recognized as that. So if you imagine the Arabian Peninsula as you are looking at it, the westernmost strip along the Red Coast, along the coast of the Red Sea, that is known as Tihama. And then after that, as though you are looking at it, there's Tihama, then there's Hijaz. And then after the Hijaz, you've got Najd. Especially towards the northeast, towards Iraq. And below Najd, and to the east of Najd, you've got an area known as Urud, which includes Bahrain. And Oman. But when we say Bahrain, uh, again, I've mentioned many times before, especially in Kitab al-Zakah, when I was explaining the Hadith. Today, Bahrain is just an island. But originally, Bahrain was the eastern region of Arabia. And the island was just part of the whole region of Bahrain. So Bahrain was actually uh, inland as well as the island. So it was the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula was known as Bahrain. So that's in Oman, that was known as Urud, and then towards the south you've got Yemen. So you've got Urud, Najd, Yemen, Hijaz in the middle, Mecca, Medina, all fall in Hijaz, and Tihama, Jeddah, Yambur, Aqaba, all the eastern, so all the uh, western cities right on the coast, whether they are new or old, that strip is known as Tihama. Strangely, though, Tihama at times used to be, well, Mecca was referred to Tihama as well. So sometimes when they used to say Tihama, they meant the strip along the coast. Sometimes it meant Mecca al Mukarramah and its surrounding region. Here, it's the area around Mecca. So they were the confidants of the Prophet ﷺ from the people of Tihama, meaning Mecca and its surrounding region. Faqal. So, Budayl ibn Warqa al Khuzai came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, Inni taraktu Ka'b ibn Lu'ayyin wa Amir ibn Lu'ayyin nazalu a'dada miyahi al Hudaybiyah. Budayl ibn Warqa came with this group of people of the Khuzai and he said to the Messenger, he wasn't a Muslim at the time, he said, Oh Muhammad, I have left behind. Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay at the wells of the waters of Hudaybiyah. Remember I explained earlier that the Quraysh had come out to the nearest part of Hudaybiyah to Mecca where there were many wells and they had occupied the whole area. The Prophet ﷺ was towards the western part where there was only a single well spring. So Budayl ibn Warqa came and he said, O oh Muhammad, I have left behind at the wells of the waters of Hudaybiyah Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay. They have nizalu, they have settled at the wells of the waters of Hudaybiyah. A'dad here means wells. So who was Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay? I know I've gone into some detail here to explain Khuzar, Tihama, but it's necessary, otherwise you can't understand the hadith, it's as simple as that. These are just two lines. I've left behind Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay. Sometimes you'd actually find people say, oh, there were two people that he left behind at the wells of Hudaybiyah. Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay were two sons of the ninth ancestor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
محمد بن عبد الله بن عبد المطلب بن هاشم بن عبد مناف بن قصي بن كلاب بن مرة بن كعب بن لؤي ابن غالب ابن فحر فحر بن مالك was the person after whom the whole tribe was named Quraysh Fihr, the son of Malik, he was the 11th ancestor of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name was Fihr, the son of Malik, but his title was Quraysh, meaning little shark. And thus he came to be known. All of his descendants are known as the people of Quraysh. His son was Ghalib. Ghalib's son was Lu'ay. So, Quraysh's grandson was Lu'ay. That's the ninth ancestor of the Prophet ﷺ. He definitely had two sons, Amir and Ka'b. Ka'b, the son of Lu'ay, and Amir, the son of Lu'ay. Remember I said earlier that Qusay ibn Kilab, the fifth ancestor of the Messenger ﷺ, he brought, he gathered the members of the Quraysh and he led them against the Khuza'a and invaded Mecca and drove the Khuza'a out. After that, it still didn't mean that all the Quraysh came and lived in Mecca. Rather, what happened is Qusay, he gathered his own immediate family as well as the rest of the rest of the cousins and the other clans from his sixth ancestor, Quraysh. And they all collectively invaded Mecca. But then what he did is that his immediate family and his children and the ones closest to him, he brought them into the center of the city of Mecca. And all the others were given locations to live in and occupy on the outskirts of Mecca. So this was another division within the Quraysh. The Qusay's family was called Quraysh al-Batin, meaning the Quraysh of the hollow or the Quraysh of the interior. And the others were called Quraysh al-Zahir or Quraysh al-Zawahir, meaning the Quraysh of the outskirts. But then you had the core of the Quraysh within the city. You had the others from of the Quraysh just on the outskirts of the city, but you actually still had Quraysh around the city, outside. But within the city of Mecca, most of, virtually all of the Quraysh, or at least most of them, if not all of them, they were all from the children of Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay, the eighth the sons of the ninth ancestor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So when he says, Budayl ibn Warqas came, you see the Arabs were very particular. See, he mentions a ninth ancestor and everyone understands what he's talking about. They, they knew the lineage by heart and the ancestry of the animals. They did. If they had a camel, they knew the, they knew the lineage, going back generations, of their camels, of their horses. So why wouldn't they know about their own people? For them it was a very significant thing. I explain all of this because without this you may, you, we may not be able to understand the hadith properly. Anyway, so Budayl ibn Warqa says that, O oh Muhammad, I have left Ka'b Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay at the wells of the waters of Hudaybiyah. What he meant is, I have left the Quraysh of Mecca. Because all of the Quraysh of Mecca al Mukarramah within the city, whether the interior or the exterior, the outskirts, were all ultimately the descendants of Ka'b ibn Lu'ay and Amir ibn Lu'ay. He then says, وَمَعْهُمْ الْعُوذُ الْمُطَافِيلِ And with them are the milch camels. 
المطافيل of young ones. What he meant is that the Quraysh have come out of Mecca, a large contingent, and they've camped at the wells of Hudaybiyah. And they've brought with them وَمَعْهُمْ الْعُوذ They've brought with them camels that have just recently given birth. Milch camels, the ones that give milk. So they've brought along with them milch camels. الْعُوذ المطافيل Milch camels with their young ones. Because obviously if they've just given birth, they won't leave the young ones uh, separated from the mother animals. So what's the meaning of, what's the significance of them having come out of Mecca along with their animals and their milch camels? The significance is that they give milk, copious milk, and that means that the Quraysh had planned to come out and camp at Hudaybiyah for the long haul. They were in it for the long haul. And under no circumstances would they allow the Prophet ﷺ to enter the city. And they were camped at Hudaybiyah, well prepared, armed with their armor, dressed in leopard skins, as I mentioned last week, and ready for battle, and camped for the long haul. They had brought their provisions with them, including milch camels with their young ones. That's the meaning of وَمَعَهُمْ الْعُوذُ الْمَطَافِيلِ وَهُمْ مُقَاتِلُوكَ And they will battle with you, Budayl ibn Warqa said to the Prophet ﷺ وَصَادُوكَ عَنِ الْبَيْتِ And they will prevent you from the house. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ إِنَّا لَمْ نَجِئْ لِقِتَالِ أَحَدِ We have not come to battle with anyone. وَلَكِنَّا جِئْنَا مُعْتَمِرِينَ Rather, we have come to perform the Umrah. وَإِنَّ Quraysh, and indeed the Quraysh, قَدْ نَهِكَتْهُمُ الْحَرْبُ War has weakened them. وَأَضَرَّتْ بِهِمْ And has harmed them. Harmed them. Indeed, that's what had happened. But Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we've only come for Umrah, we haven't come to battle. So what do they want to come out armed and belligerent in that manner? Don't they realize that war has weakened them? Meaning, the war of the past six years. Ever since we left Mecca, we have been engaged. We have remained in a state of war. And that state of war, despite all the odds being stacked against the Muslims of Medina, and all the advantages and favors being stacked in, fa- in, fa- in favor of Mecca. The Meccans had achieved nothing. They lost some of their greatest leaders in the Battle of Badr. Initially, they suffered a resounding defeat in the Battle of Uhud, even though they scored a setback. Then, In the fifth year, and in between, there were many other small skirmishes in which the Quraysh suffered. Their trade routes had been cut off to Sham. And a year before, in the fifth year of Hijrah, they had besieged the city of Medina with 10,000, with 12,000 troops. And yet they had achieved nothing. So this long-term strategy of war had failed them and had harmed them. So the Prophet وسلم, said, And the Quraysh, war has weakened them بهم, and has harmed them. شاءوا, so if they wish, مُدَّةً, I will agree a term with them, i.e. a truce. مُدَّةً, I will agree a, t- a term of time with them. And what will happen in that term which I agree with them? بيني وبين الناس. They will step aside and leave the path clear between me and the people. Leave me alone. فَإِنْ أَظْهَرُ So what do I want them to do? They can't continue to battle with me. For war has weakened them, 
and harm them. So what do they want? I am willing to compromise. And I am willing to agree to terms with them. To agree a period of truce in which we shall not harm them, they will not harm us. We will both be free. They will leave the area clear between me and the people. They won't come in between me and anyone else. And ultimately, the Prophet ﷺ was saying this. Because remember, it was a very tribal society. And he was one of the Quraysh. He was one of their people. So it didn't make sense for them to battle with him at their own expense against all the other Arab tribes of Arabia, some of whom were allies of the Quraysh, but many of whom were their natural enemies. Then the Prophet ﷺ explained that it's in their favor if they just leave me alone and step back. Why? He says, فَإِنْ أَظْهَرُ If I become dominant, i.e. if they leave me alone, I won't bother them. If I engage with the other tribes of Arabia, and I invite them to my religion of Islam, and they all embrace the religion, then soon the Quraysh will see that the rest of Arabia has followed the messenger, has embraced his religion. So what will, situation will they be in then? He says, فَإِنْ أَظْهَرْ So if I become dominant, فَإِنْ شَاءُ Then if they wish, أَنْ يَدْخُرُوا فِي مَا دَخَلَ فِيهِ النَّاسِ That they also enter into the same religion that others have entered. فَعَلُوا They can do so later. So they can just sit back and wait and watch. He was so confident that tell them not to battle with me. Leave me alone. I won't hassle them, they won't hassle me. If, if, he, if they leave me with the other people and I become dominant, then what will happen? The rest of the tribes, they embrace Islam and they become my followers, then they can see, and if they wish, they can do the same as a rest. وَإِلَّا Otherwise, فَقَدْ جَمْ They will have Rested. The meaning of they will have rested. Tell them to wait. Don't fight with me now. Wait to see what happens. If I become dominant, then once I become dominant, they won't really have much of a choice, will they? They still have the choice of not joining me, but then more than likely they will do what everyone else has done, which is they will join me and follow me. However, he then says, Otherwise they will have rested. What does that mean? You see, the Prophet وسلم, what he means is that let them wait. If I become dominant, then they have the choice of joining me and following me as everyone else has done. But if I am not dominant and I am defeated by everyone else, then they can fight me. And them fighting me then is far better for them because they will have had a, a time and a period in which they will have rested, recuperated, gathered their strength, prepared, and be ready for another round. But Rasulullah, that's the meaning of illa faqad jammu, otherwise they will have rested. But it doesn't seem to apparently make sense because the Prophet وسلم, he left out part of the sentence. Which part of the sentence did he leave out? And he never uttered the words, but if I am not dominant. Why? Because the Prophet وسلم, had no doubt in his mission. No doubt whatsoever. He did not say this from a position of weakness. That look, tell them to take a step back and watch, wait and see. If I am dominant, then they can join me. If not, then they can fight me. The Prophet ﷺ didn't even say, if not. He, all he said was, if I become dominant, if I prevail, for in adhar, I don't like to use the word dominant, but rather, for in adhar, if I prevail, 
then if they wish, they can do what everyone else has done and enter and embrace the same religion. Otherwise, they will have rested. That's the meaning of otherwise they will have rested. Apparently it doesn't make sense, but this is what it means. Otherwise, if I do not prevail and others do not join me, then, of course, they wouldn't want to join me then. Then they would want to continue their battle with me. But wouldn't they be in a better position to continue their battle later, after having recovered and recuperated and prepared for another round and be in a stronger position? But the Prophet ﷺ didn't use the words, if I do not prevail, because he wasn't speaking from a position of weakness. He had no doubt whatsoever. None. But then, if he had no doubt, why did he even give a choice? Why did he say, if I prevail? And although he never explicitly said it, that if I don't prevail, that's what he was implying. So why still give the two choices? The reason is he wasn't speaking about himself. He was speaking from the perspective of the Quraysh. That from what the Quraysh can see, they are thinking there's only one of two outcomes. Either he prevails or he doesn't prevail. So the Prophet is speaking in their language and saying that why don't they think? What they are doing doesn't make sense. They fought with me, they've battled with me for six years, they haven't achieved anything. War has weakened them and has harmed. It doesn't make sense for them to continue in this way. Rather, it makes more sense for them to take a step back, leave me alone, wait and see. If I prevail, whose language is he using? Their language. From whose perspective is he speaking? From their perspective, the Quraysh. That they should wait and see. If he prevails, then after that, they have a choice. They can still join him, like others have done. But if he doesn't prevail, then fight. Then okay, we'll fight with him. And we'll be in a better position to do so then. Because we will have rested and recuperated. That's why the Prophet ﷺ even used the words, if, if. Sorry, he only used them once. He didn't even utter the words, if I don't prevail. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, however, وَإِنْهُمْ أَبَوْ However, if they refuse, i.e. to act sensibly in the manner that I have just explained. وَإِنْهُمْ أَبَوْ But if they refuse and persist in battling with me, then the Prophet ﷺ said, فَوَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِهِ Then by that Allah in whose hand rests my soul. لَأُقَاتِلَنَّهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِي هَذَا I will most assuredly battle with them over this affair of mine. Hatta until tan farida salifati, my neck is severed. Hatta tan farida salifati until my neck is severed. Wala yun fidan Allahu amru. Wala yun fidan Allahu amra. And most assuredly, Allah will cause his affair to come to pass. فقال بديل سبديل ابن ورقاء الخزاعي said سأبلغهم ما تقول I will convey to them what you are saying. قال the narrator says فانطلق حتى أتى قريشا he went until he came to the Quraysh and then the hadith continues. I'll stop here. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enables us to understand. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala abdihi wa rasulih nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashidu wa la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.